what went wrong? It is the Putin system that went wrong. In this Putin system, everything uh, is based on actually one factor, which is survival of Putin as, as president of Russia. In most of cases, system Putin has doomed the oper this part of the operation to failure. Why? Because Putin has uh, assigned his favorites into specific positions within the Russian armed forces. So nobody is going to challenge him if he's got a bad idea. If he says, you know, that I think this is what happens, is it very unlikely that the generals are going to be like, oh, hold on a second, because if we do this, then X is going to happen. Yeah. The problem is, this is the way you see it, and this is the way plenty of other people see it. But Putin, in his own position, he's constantly seeing himself surrounded by competition, by contrahands, by opposition or whatever, you know, some, some kind of threat for him. It's, it's different from his point of view, and this is what we have to keep in mind, that Putin mm. sees the things entirely differently than you do, than anybody else does. Putin is Putin. He's not you, he's not me, he's not somebody else, he's just Putin. For the West, it's better, or in the interest of politicians and the economy, it's better to fight a war to profit, not to win. Because if you fight to win, you you know, you know send 1,000 artillery pieces to Ukraine, Ukraine defeats Russia tomorrow in the morning, and uh, the war is over. Party is over. Yeah, and what then? Nobody's earning anything from that. Nobody. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is a military analyst and historian who's been one of the most objective voices covering the conflict in Ukraine. Tom Cooper, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you very much. Very nice to be with you. Oh, well, it's great to have you on the show. So let's talk about the conflict. We wanted to start by... Uh, just recapping from the beginning for people who maybe saw the initial events, didn't really follow everything that happened. So can you just talk us through what happened in the initial phase of the Russian invasion? Yeah, sure. What happened early on was that uh, there was an attempt, uh, obviously not even properly planned, but, but driven by Putin's demands for uh, Russian or selected parts of the Russian armed forces to overrun the Ukrainian leadership, to, to knock out specific parts of, 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 of or paralyze actually, actually uh, parts of Ukrainian armed forces, uh, but foremost to, 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 to overrun and, and to decapitate Ukrainian uh, political leadership, which means foremost government. And the idea was obviously to, to land on four uh, major airports around Kiev and from there to, to, to drive into downtown Kiev to whether kill or at least arrest the government and replace it by, some, by somebody who would have been friendlier to Putin. That was the original idea. And because of this, uh, the initial uh, uh, ballistic and cruise missile strikes were not as intensive or as, uh, or, as, or as effective as they might have been if there was a wish to really knock out the Ukrainian armed forces right from the start and to, to, to destroy them, so to say, their leadership as well. The idea was obviously to, to, to capture the government and that everything was depending on the dissolution, capturing the government, of, on removing it. And obviously there was a lot of illusion about uh, Ukrainians, so to say, rising to, 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 to greet the Russians coming in and eventually three days later to, help, to hold military parades in, in Kiev and Kharkiv and everything is fine and uh, great and Ukraine is now Russia again. It's it's really interesting the, the way you put that because it's in very it's in very simple terms. Now I'm going to ask you a layman question, Tom, and take this as broadly or as as as, as you want to. But what went wrong? Because when the when the invasion started, I think there were a lot of people thinking, well, this is you know this is a mighty power of Russia against Ukraine. They've got this huge army. They've got the weaponry. They've got the men. Why hasn't it gone to plan? 
what went what went wrong? Uh, it is the Putin system that went wrong. In this Putin system, everything uh, is based on actually one factor, which is survival of Putin as, as president of Russia, retaining him in power so he can continue collecting cuts from or the cut from all the possible enterprises from the state and so on. So enriching himself, maintaining himself in power and his friends in power. So in order for this system to survive, they have to lie all the time. And one of the lies is that uh, Ukrainians would be some sort of, uh, well, more than brotherly people to, to Russia. And because of this, they would look, be looking forward to, to, to be very unschlussed, so to say, or, 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 or rejoined into the, to, to the motherland, motherland uh, Russia, and that they would uh, greet the Russian troops and that they are, they are controlled by some sort of Nazi regime, uh, which is suppressing them, terrorizing and genociding Russians and so on. So, so this basic idea was a big lie. And it came so far that even Putin lied to himself. He, he fell for his own illusions. This is what went wrong. And because of his own illusions, he, he sent the Spetsnaz and, and the VDV, this is airborne, Russian airborne troops, into Ukraine under entirely wrong uh, conditions. He has sent them in, expecting them to meet only light resistance, if at all, and you know to rapidly achieve uh, their, 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 their aims. And this is what didn't work because the Ukrainians rose and even if there was lots of chaos and even if there was you know shock and surprise by this initial attack, they they they, they took up arms and defended and, and fought back. And this is what 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 was unexpected for the Russians. And Tom, when you talk about things going wrong, uh, when you describe the initial phase of the attack, which is attempting to take over the airport and decapitate the regime, it sounds a little bit to me like what a, a superpower might do to a small country in the Middle East. You come in, you remove the, the head of the regime, and then you take over. And it obviously didn't go down that way. But after that, we obviously saw uh, these columns coming in from the north, uh, and the big attack in the south, and obviously the push in the east, and those haven't even in the initial phase. They were they made some progress, but they were repelled. Can you talk to us about that phase of the invasion as well? Yes, of course. Uh, yes, it was an idea, you know, of a quick quick takeover that was fundamental to the entire plan. If if, if there was really a plan, the way the things look like, Putin didn't even discuss this plan. With Shoigu and Gerasimov, he simply ordered specific uh, field commanders, commanders of, of, of uh, combined arms armies of the Russian ground forces, to, let's say, for example, move the Brigade A from place B to place C and uh, capture the government. It was that simple. And uh, then the idea was to follow up, you know, because these light airborne troops and special troops, they cannot hold uh, any kind of area for, a, for an extended period of time. They cannot do that on their own because they're lightly armed and they cannot do that without supplies. This meant that uh, they have to uh, follow the light troops. And this is also part of standard Russian uh, war fighting doctrine, so to say, uh, to, they were to be followed by, by ground troops which in, in the case of Russia is always mechanized units. They do not call them mechanized, they call them tank units or they call them uh, motorized infantry or whatever else, but they are mechanized units and they were to follow and to secure, to help the, the, the special forces and, and uh, airborne forces to secure the, uh, the areas they have taken during the first, during, during the initial strike. And then came again, what, what happened as next was twofold, so to say. In most of cases, system Putin has doomed the oper this part of the operation to failure. Why? Because Putin has uh, assigned his favorites into specific position, positions within the Russian armed forces. Favorites who were permitted to enrich themselves 
on condition uh, of unaccountability to anybody except to Putin, and on condition of providing him with his cut from from all the money they they were they were pocketing all the time. This is how Putin system system Putin works works so that you appoint your friends and, and, and less of uh, family members but foremost friends or aides or associates or whoever into specific positions where they are cashing from uh, huge contracts they are, they, are, they, are, they are signing with the state and then they are overpricing all the time and from this this income they are financing Putin and when he needs something he just needs to call and he's getting his money or his favors or whatever else in in return for this for appointing people to such positions and it's the same in the in the army on the other side because of this the army has never completed its reforms it's it has never really converted itself into a professional force and the the the, the generals commanding it are incompetent. They are Putin's favorites, but they are not there because they because of merits of because of their skills or capabilities, but but, but because they are Putin's favorites. Sorry for this reason. Are you tired of using bulky old wallets, giving you a bulge where you don't want it to be? My old wallet was massive, so it brought all the ladies to the yard, which was a huge distraction and got in the way of my esteemed work on trigonometry. Ridge wallets have an incredible solution for you. This is mine, sleek, stylish, and with an industrial look to it. It can fit 12 cards with cash on the back using a clip like this one or a strap. We've got one for the whole team. I've got one, Francis has one, even our producer Anton has one, but he's from Liverpool, so he flogged his on the black market. The great thing about Ridge is that they give you a lifetime guarantee, which means if you want, you can have only one wallet for the rest of your life. Ridge are so confident in the quality of their product, they will give you 45 days to test drive their wallets. That means you can get the wallet, use it, and if you don't like it, you can return it within 45 days. And that's not all. For every dollar you spent on the Ridge Wallets website, you'll be entered into a competition to win a brand new upgraded Ford Bronco. Or if you can't drive like Francis, then you can win $75,000 in cash. Winners will be announced in October, so get spending. spending. Because Ridge are such great guys, they're gonna give you 10% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to ridge.com forward slash trigger. That's ridge.com forward slash trigger and use our special code, which is of course, trigger. Tom, isn't it also part of the problem as well? Like you've got a guy like Putin at the top who, to put it mildly, is a little bit ruthless, right? So nobody is gonna challenge him if he's got a bad idea. If he says, you know, that I think this is what happens, is it very unlikely that the generals are gonna be like, oh, hold on a second, because if we do this and X is gonna happen. Yeah. The problem is this is the way you see it, and this is the way mm. plenty of other people see it. But Putin, in his own position, he's constantly seeing himself surrounded by by, by competition, by contrahands, by opposition, or whatever you know, some some kind of threat for him. And this is why he has established, for example, the Ross Guardia. Ross Guardia is a paramilitary force which is responsible solely to Putin. It is not responsible to to the Ministry of Defense in Moscow. But it is possible solely to Putin. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that in the case that the armed forces would stage a coup against him, he has a, it's his own military force to counter such an operation. So the, you have the Ross Guardia as, as pe, sort of Praetorian guard for Putin, responsible solely to Putin. You don't, you do not, you barely see it fighting on the front lines in Ukraine, but it's always in the rear, securing the back, the, the rear areas. You know. The, towns behind the front line, villages behind the front line, checking what is the local population doing, but also keeping an eye on the Russian armed forces fighting on the front line. So Tom, therefore, you this... know, it's, it's, it's different from his point of view. And this is what we have to keep in mind, that Putin mm -hmm. sees the things entirely differently than you do, uh, than anybody else does. Putin is Putin. He's not you, he's not me, he's not somebody else. He's just Putin. Mm. Mm. Well, Tom, as someone who's from Russia, I hear everything you're saying, and it's very familiar to me, both about yes. Putin and the, the military hierarchy and so on. But people would argue that 
while obviously there were failures from the Russian invasion at the beginning, they did manage to capture significant territory in the northeast around Kharkov. Uh, they managed to capture a huge swathe of land in the south. Um, That's the point, yes, yeah. yeah. Yes, they managed to eventually grind down the resistance in Mariupol in, in the southeast on the Sea of Azov and capture that. They've made significant progress in the Donbass. Um, in, it's cost them a lot, but they have over the last six months. Uh, yes, eventually they had to withdraw from Kiev and so on, but they've still made a lot of progress, You would, I think a lot of people would credibly argue. Why were they able to do that? That's the point. <clears throat> there was a part of, the only part of the Russian, of this initial Putin's plan for, for, for takeover of Ukraine that, that did work was in the south. There are also the, the most combat experienced element of the Russian ground, ground forces was deployed. This is the 58th Combined Arms Army. And next to it, there was the 49th Combined Arms Army. These two armies stormed from Crimean, from the occupied Crimean Peninsula towards the, towards the north. And now the 58 had a very important task, which was to reach Zaporozhia and to, to uh, reach Mariupol from the west, from the west. And uh, the 49th had at least an, uh, as an important task, which was to, to take Kherson, take Mykolaiv, and then advance all the way to the border with Moldova, where there is a part of Moldova, east of uh, the, the, the Nesta River, controlled by Russian separatists, so-called Transnistria. And in that way, Putin was aiming not only to, to, to take away the entire Ukrainian coast away from Ukraine, to bring it under his control, but also to establish land con uh, connection to Transnistria. And these two armies have, thanks to treachery, obvious treachery, on the part of, uh, I don't know exactly which. Tre treason. treason. Treason, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Treason by, on the part of uh, higher ranking officers in the Ukrainian armed forces. It has worked flawlessly, really. They have reached Kherson within two or three days. No problem. They have, they have uh, closed the siege of Mariupol within two days. The only thing that didn't work uh, was uh, the capture of Zaporozhia. But otherwise, it, that this is what brought the biggest conquest. In comparison uh, to this advance in the south, you have advanced in, in, in Kiev area and, and Chernihiv areas, in the north and, and in Kharkiv. All of them failed. The 35th uh, Combined Arms Army did manage to reach outskirts of, of Kiev, but uh, in turn was almost cut off from its uh, supply lines. And there was this huge, because there was only ro one highway it could use to reach Kiev. So it, it was slowed down, bogged down by its own supply problems. The 41st Combined Arms Army, which was advancing on Chernihiv, fell apart in the process of advancing on Chernihiv in the face of relatively light resistance by, by one and a half, something like one and a half Ukrainian brigades. So it fell apart while advancing for 70 to 80 kilometers to Chernihiv. Uh, you have the first Guards Tanks Army, the, the, the elite of, of, uh, of, the, of the Russian armed forces. It fell apart while, while passing by Sumy and trying to advance towards uh, Kiev from the east. And uh, worst of all, the two armies that were advancing, that, that, that were tasked with capturing uh, Kharkiv, they also actually fall up, fell apart in the process. I mean, there were only two Ukrainian brigades offering serious resistance in the Kharkiv area during the first week of war, and they didn't manage to 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 to, to drive around the city. They didn't even manage to drive. They did manage to drive into the city for a few hours, and they were destroyed to the last almost. So this part, northern part of the invasion, failed miserably. This is where the Russian armed forces failed on Putin from Putin's point of view, and this is why he's terribly mad about them already since months. Also why he's punishing them by these constant orders for assaulting heavily uh, fortified uh, urban areas of Eastern Ukraine ever since. On the contrary, in the South, he just, you know, ordered, okay, you have taken what you have, secure it, and that's fine with me. They are not punished so much. They are even reinforced by, the, by airborne troops now in August. So Tom, Looking at the situation now, 
Do you think the Russians are going to be happy with what they have? Or would, would they regard this invasion as a failure at this particular moment? Okay. When we talk about Russians, I'm again, I, I'm a little bit insistent in this regards. There's Putin, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, then there are Russian, let's yeah. say nationalists, chauvinists, extremists, whatever we want to call yeah. them, and then there are Russians, okay? Now, Putin is not happy. But because he's all the time forced to downsize his aims for what he wants to do in Ukraine. Initially, he wants to take over all of the country, then just the country east of the Dnipro River, then, then now, you know, just secure Luhansk and Donetsk and, and Kherson and Zaporozhia. Meanwhile, he is even to, to less than this and so on and so on. Then you have the Russian extremists who, whom who are actually misused by Putin for his purposes. And this is where you get the story about our uh, history of Russia and Ukraine is so complex and blah, 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 blah. Uh, they're daydreaming about things, you know, and have no, actually no other purpose but keeping or helping uh, keep Putin in power. Most of them have actually no say in, in any kind of decision making. They're just, you know, led to, to cash their income from TV appearances and so on. Or by... Uh, being representatives in the Duma, in the, in the Russian parliament. And then you have the rest of the Russians. And what, what is this rest of the Russians actually doing? This is the majority of the population, over 90%. Nobody really knows because Putin wouldn't let us know. Wouldn't even let him them know what do they want. So some of them are probably pro-Putin or at least pro-Russia against Ukraine and really convinced that Ukraine is... Uh, controlled by some kind of Nazi regime. Others apparently do not care. They want to survive. They, they, they are fighting their everyday life for survival, uh, fighting their every, every, everyday struggle for survival, nothing else, you know. So it is I'm making quite distinctions between this. But crucial point is Putin is not happy with what he has achieved or, or failed to achieve so far. And he is definitely determined to, to continue, you know, holding as much of Ukraine as possible. And Tom, this brings us nicely onto uh, last week's events where there was a huge counterattack. Uh, there was a small counterattack in the south near Kherson and a big counterattack which was very successful in the north. Uh, and I am someone who's observing this conflict and I, I have my loyalties, but I also try to be objective about it as well, of course. And while I was very happy to see the counterattack succeed in the way that it did, I was a bit concerned that people in the West got overexcited about it because, yes, the Russians abandoned a lot of military equipment, yes, ammunition, yes, land, but they didn't lose huge numbers of troops. They, there was no major encirclement. How significant, first of all, was the counterattack? What should people in the West who are lay people like us watching this take away from it? Is this some, it, a lot of people seem to think this is like the end of the war. Can you tell us what this actually means? It is just another episode in this war, nothing else. Uh, I have to, uh, even if trying to explain this to a layman, I have to, to go into a little bit of technical details. For example, the number of brigades deployed in Kherson for this counteroffensive, you know, in late August, is the same like the number of brigades deployed for this uh, counteroffensive in eastern Kharkiv a few days later. So the, the, the force is not that different or anything. Where there is a difference is that in, in eastern Kharkiv, uh, the Ukrainians have managed to find a sector of front line where the Russian artillery was not that over, overwhelming them as it is on other important parts of the front line. And this enabled them to concentrate the artillery, lots of forces, which is some seven or eight brigades on a very small area to overpower, quickly overpower the Russian front line and punch through to get into the rear of the, of the Russian front line. In Kherson, they didn't manage that feat yet. In Kherson, they're all the time trying to bridge the Russian front line, but so far have, with few temporary excep- exceptions, they have not managed to, 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 to reach this breakthrough at operational level, as it's called in, in, in military uh, vocabulary. So what happened then? In Kherson, they, are, they have moved the front lines, they have pushed the Russians back, they have liberated lots of places, but overall, the Russian armed forces in Kherson are still, well, depleted but intact. They are still operational. 
what happened in Eastern Kharkiv is that uh, once they have breached the front line, which was a sector of front line, which was poorly uh, occupied by the Russians, they have managed to drive through very deep into the Russian back. What then happened was inertia, so, so-called inertia. Uh, in response to several Russian counterattacks, all of which came from the north, the Ukrainian troops moved, or U- involved Ukrainian brigades moved towards the north too. It is also so that while trying to move from, from uh, Balaklea towards the south, towards the Izium, they were slowed down by ever stronger units of uh, Russian army. So instead on, on Izium, they went for Kupiansk instead. This has collapsed the entire northern section of the, of the Russian front line. Really threw everybody into chaos. And this is what resulted in this massive retreat and, and lots of vehicles being abandoned and so on. And Ukrainians liberating, you know, dozens, 30, 40, 50, 60 villages, Kupiansk and, and, and everything else, reaching the Oskil River. But the actual aim of that operation it is a guess, I do not have any kind of evidence for this, but this is logical, was actually to, to drive into the rear, into the back of the first guards tank army in the Izium area. And this is what they have they, they, they have not initially managed. As first, there was too much resistance, and second, the road network between Kupiansk and Izium. There's only one highway. It is not a direct highway. It is not running around the Oskil River. So they had a problem to approach this this area. And when they finally approached Izium, they have uh, passed by the town because there were too many Russian forces in, inside the town. And they were still resisting too fiercely. And at that point in time, it would have been crucial for the Ukrainian troops on the southern, southern side of the resulting bulge, so to say, to punch through the, uh, to punch through the Russian front lines and to close the uh, the trap, so to say, around the First Guards Army. They have attempted to do so, but they didn't manage that. And this is why the, the First Guards Army actually managed to, 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 to run away, to escape. Of course, it has lost, what, 100, 150 tanks and around 100 armored fighting vehicles and so on. But if you check the losses, you can see that the, uh, the Russians lost very few artillery during this operation. It is something like 18, 20 artillery pieces. This is nothing. One should keep in mind that the entire Russian front line is held together de facto by their artillery, by their superior artillery. So if they would have suffered a loss of 100 heavy guns, that would have been a massive loss for the Russians. But tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers, they do not, Putin cannot care less because it's not hurting him. He has 10,000 of these stored somewhere, you know, around Russia. He can always replace them. But artillery pieces, they, this would have been much harder to replace. And uh, on the contrary, they have managed to ex- extract most of their artillery uh, towards Svatove, Svatove area. And uh, those, as much as uh, an immense success, because especially because you know it is uh, the first major Ukrainian offensive that has, that has really been successful on its own, so to say, where Ukrainians have really beaten the Russians. And this is why why it's important. This operation is far from ending this war. It is just another episode in this war. The First Guards Army has started itself. The Russians have established a new front line along the Oskil River. And that's it. You know, now the Ukrainians have to find another place where they are going to to, to attack again and perhaps achieve something similar. In the meantime, we shouldn't forget that Russians remain on offensive, on, on initiative, all the way further down south, you know, southeastern Ukraine. From They are still attacking Bakhmut, they are still attacking along the former line of control, and so on and so on. So it is far away, far away from, from, from ending this war. And Tom, are there causes for optimism? Because I, I was reading some of your articles on, on Medium. There's a lot of, I think it's um, weaponry that the Ukrainians haven't, have, haven't yet received yet which means that they'll be strengthened when it comes to the battles in the coming months. For cautious optimism. Uh, the point is that, uh, yes, the USA has promised yet more weaponry, but most of that is ammunition. Ukraine is not about to receive yet more heavy artillery, and that is the problem. Uh, Russia remains superior in regards of artillery and vastly superior 
through Ukraine. Just like before these two operations, this is what is holding Kherson together, Russian forces in Kherson together. This is why their front line is not collapsing, because they still have more artillery than Ukrainians over there, which means they, they are still capable of hampering Ukrainian attempts to drive between their Russian uh, fortifications, between Russian strongholds, and outflank them and cut, cut them off from their supply lines. This is this is the reason why is that so important, the artillery. And we don't, it, 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 I mean, we don't. The West hasn't, still hasn't taken care to provide enough artillery to Ukraine. And this is not going to change anytime soon. And why not, Tom? Why not? Well, as we can see, it's a little bit complex issue. Uh, for example, the United States and the European part of the NATO have lots of uh, old artillery pieces, caliber 155 millimeter, in their reserve. They are stored for 20 years, sometimes longer, and so on. They're not in use, but they're not delivering them. What they do deliver are uh, 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 artillery pieces or weapon systems which are currently in production. Why? Because this is bringing profit. It means that uh, governments, whether the U US or governments of the, of the European part of the NATO, can spend to buy yet more weapons that are currently in production from from the defense sector. This is pure profit, uh, profit, nothing else. This is the, only, the sole reason. Tom, why is that I so? Suppose, because yeah. why is that so? This is because the, the, the defense sector, the companies which are selling these weapons, which are manufacturing them. Sorry, this is like in every in every other aspect of our economic life. They are bribing governments to buy weapons, not to deliver reserve or uh, old ones from the reserve. That's how it works. What I was going to ask you then, I suppose the obvious question is, does the West actually want Ukraine to win? Yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> the West does want to, Ukraine to win. But it's, uh, in the West, you do not have, the politicians in the West, they do not have this uh, clear idea of, of fighting war to win. For them, Fighting a war is an opportunity to profit for, for companies, for private and, and corporate uh, interests, supporting them, paying their elections, election campaigns and so on, to, 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 for such interests to, to profit. So you have the same situation like all the time since Vietnam already, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know. For the West, it's better, or in the interest of politicians and the economy, it's better to fight a war to profit, not to win. Because if you fight to win, you you know you send 1,000 artillery pieces to Ukraine. Ukraine defeats Russia tomorrow in the morning. That is now hyperbola, and uh, the war is over. Party is over. Yeah, and what then? Nobody is earning anything from that. Nobody. But if you you know keep Ukraine afloat and supply it with weapons which are currently under production, your sponsors in the rear, the guys in the shade, in the shadow. They are profiting, everything is fine, you know, and we go on just like nothing happened. The only thing disturbing all of this, the party, is is this uh, story with, with uh, gas deliveries and, and high energy prices. Oh, gosh, this is a little bit disturbing because, you know, the population is against this and uh, we have to do something and curb the high energy prices. So we have to keep this under, under control, you know, at least to pretend we are trying to keep them under control and so on, although it would be very easy. But, well, and that's liberal democracy <laughs> in, in the economy. And, Tom, what difference is winter going to make to this conflict? Because it's around the corner in a couple of months and Ukrainian yeah. winters are notoriously bitter. Yeah. Well, what is making... It's going to bring bigger advantages for Ukraine. Primary reason so far why the Russian armed forces were relatively successful, which is actually just one segment of Russian armed forces, this is the ground forces, have been successful the last, uh, let's say, since April, since it, since it got warmer in Ukraine, is the combination between their, their UAVs, Orlan-10 in, in particular, and their artillery. Orlan-10 is a very, rather, or, or rather primitive military system. It's not even military, it's actually... Only the, the, the fuselage and wings are military grade. Everything else is actually bought on, on open market. You know, Canon cameras and Canon video, cam video cameras and, and ECM systems, everything they install into these UAVs 
is uh, civilian grade equipment, which means that it cannot work at temperatures below five degrees centigrade, which in turn means as soon as it's freezing outside, the Russians are going to be blind along the battlefield. And then they, they are going to have huge problems with finding the Ukrainians along with that. This is why Russians have now rushed to buy UAVs from, from uh, Iran, because Iran, thanks to, to Chinese support and, and technical support and know-how, and even organizational production in Iran, uh, Iran is capable of delivering military-grade UAVs. So the Russians are obviously planning to replace their, their, their own UAVs, which are useless in winter, by Iranian UAVs. We're going to see if this is going to be effective or not. But generally, Ukraine should be on advantage. So that's very interesting because I would have thought that it would, you know, it, it would help the Russians because they push them back and they can. And look, again, I'm a layman, but, you know, you can no restrict, problem. you know, the flow of goods and whatever else. He you just can... thinks the Russians are invulnerable to the cold. Though. Yeah, yeah he's exactly. spent a lot of time around me. Yeah. But I, I would have thought that they'd it would it would help them to kind of not starve the Ukrainians out, but certainly make things far more uncomfortable okay. for them. I mean, we have to distinguish between Ukrainian armed forces and Ukrainian civilians. We have there are millions and millions of Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine feeling this war on their uh, you know direct impact upon their uh, everyday life. They are going to be freezing. They are going to be hungry and so on. And, and they are not going to survive without extensive aid from, from the West and from Kiev and so on. This is one part of the story. But Ukrainian armed forces, they have no problem. They are already in the process of distributing winter clothing and winter equipment on their, uh, to their troops. So this is not going to be that much of a problem. Clothing, food, fuel. As you can see, the Ukrainian uh, supply system is working perfectly. And the Russians have massive problems just trying to find it, you know, in order to hit it, for example, from the air with, with, with cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and so on. They're not successful in this regard. So this is not a problem for the Ukrainian armed forces. On the contrary, because of the system Putin and because of all the lies with which they are feeding their people for, for decades already, and because now they're starting to realize the extension of these lies, the morale is very low. And then you have the system Putin in regards of command system, where, the, where, the, where Putin is bypassing all the normal chain of command in the armed forces and all the issue, issuing uh, direct orders upon field commanders, which is spoiling everything. He's throwing, you know, every single day, he's throwing the, the, the Russian military doctrine and strategy out of the window, ignoring them completely and issuing ever new orders for assaults on, on specific objects and so on, which result in heavy casualties. But he can't care about this. Why? Because he thinks that his favorites owe him a favor, or, or, or returning a favor, all the favors he has granted to them. And so this is a, a vicious circle in, in, inside Russia, which is going to result you know, in, in further debacles like this one in Eastern Kharkiv now. This is going to happen time and again. We, However, in between of this, or such debacles, there are going to be, you know, periods of many months where the Ukrainians will have to maneuver to find such weak spots in, uh, in Russian front lines to, in order to exploit them. That is going to be crucial for the, for the coming winter. Hey, Konstantin, do you want better mental health? I'm from Russia. We don't have mental health. So how do you deal with mental health? You drink vodka, then go out and wrestle bear. If you leave, you feel better. If you die, you're not real man. What about the bear's feelings? It's Russian bear. It has no feelings. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, not sleeping enough, sleeping too much, under eating, and overeating. Sleeping too much, under eating. This is Western disease. Therapy has really helped me in my life to concentrate and focus. It's really important to have someone impartial who you can talk to about the tricky issues that you're struggling to deal with. Therapy has played a really important role in helping me to deal with my ADHD and become better in all areas of my life. Why is he telling them how weak he is? Drink vodka, feel better. 
BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Trigonometry funds get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com forward slash trigger, especially if they're not real men. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash trigger. Tom, just a very quick question before I move on the conversation. Uh, what is your estimate for casualties on both sides? I, I prefer not to mix into into such discussions because we do not have any kind of firm figures. You know, we have we do have official claims de facto from from Ukraine. We have next to nothing from Russian side, but we we have nothing really dependable in these regards. I do estimate that Ukrainian casualties are actually higher than Russian. Uh, I don't know how much, but it is it plays in the nature of things. They were they were lightly armed, uh, and they are poorly protected, especially early during the war. And as much as more combat experience than the Russians, meanwhile they are on, on offensive. When you are in offensive, you are automatically suffering heavier casualties and so on and so on. But generally, I'm sorry for people who have died. I'm sorry for those who, even more for, for those who who, who who are maimed or injured in whatever other way, but I find it pointless to talk about casualties because it's it's leading nowhere. You, we are discussing propaganda from both sides, and discussing propaganda is pointless. Sorry for that. No, no, of course, I agree. That makes sense. Uh, th that's why I asked you, because I have no idea, even though I keep a pretty close eye on the conflict, because you... Like you say, both sides, you know, they have uh, the point of communication and war is to win. It's not to communicate the truth. So uh, you, <laughs> talked about, you talked about um, the civilian infrastructure and so on. And one of the things we saw, as it, it seems to me, at least correct me if I'm wrong, is the immediate reaction from Russia to the Kharkiv counter assault has been to attack civilian infrastructure, power lines, water supply lines, etc. Yeah. What do you make of that? Is that just, you know, the Russian regime being angry and lashing out? Is it a more strategic? Uh, what's going on there? It's both of that, you know. Primarily, it's a punishment. Uh, we shouldn't forget that as, as ex-KGB, Putin is a foremost an extortionist. He's going to blackmail everybody and everything. He is ruling by blackmail. He came to power to, by blackmail. He's ruling by blackmail, and his sole political program is, you know, whom can I blackmail today? And uh, it is the same in this case. Okay, you Ukrainians are resisting me, then have something of this. Here is your resistance. I'm destroying your, your infrastructure. It's as simple as that. Punishment. I, I see. And one of the things we talked about earlier in the conversation that I really wanted to discuss with you is you mentioned that in addition to Putin's regime and ordinary Russians, there are also another... A sliver of people in between who are actually protesting against Putin privately or in their yeah. private Telegram channels and whatever, yes. who are saying that Putin is weak and he's not doing enough. And what he needs to do is announce full mobilization, put the economy on a war footing, mobilize every man between 18 and 45 or whatever it would be, 35, uh, and announce that this is no longer a special military operation, this is a full war, Russia is at war, and use the entirety of the Russian uh, economy and military to defeat Ukraine. That's what they're calling for. That hasn't happened so far. Do you think it will? No, it's not going to happen. And there, are plenty of reason, there are plenty of reasons for this. The first is it would cost Putin, Putin lots of his money, which means what he is extracting from the Russian economy and state every single day. That would cost him, it would cost him too much for this. Second but Tom, day, how much money can a man need? He's already one of the richest people in the world. I don't know, ask Putin, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he, there, there are stories about him bunkering, what, 800 billion somewhere in the West or in, in China and wherever. I don't know how much more he needs. I don't know, but he obviously has no end of needs in this regard. Okay. But let's, let's get back to your, your earlier question. Uh, the next problem is that the Russian state and administration is, as we call it in German, kaput. It's broken down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's bordering on collapse. It's not working. 
So let's say you try to, he, he announces general mobilization. First of all, he would have a massive problem just with, you know, how many people would actually follow that call. Uh, there are well-informed Russians who say more than 50% would, would ignore it. It would be an absolute catastrophe for, for, for Putin. Uh, then secondly, this would result in, in huge gatherings of armed people around Russia, which is, which is a threat for Putin. Sorry. Whether they are controlled or not by, by officers of his armed forces is secondary. It is a threat for Putin. Thirdly, <coughs> what would the Russian armed forces get from that? They would get, let's say, one million, perhaps two million of, of recruits. Okay, and who would train this, all these people? Who would keep them supplied? Who would keep them, you know, warm? Who would tell them where to sleep by night? There are too few... Uh, officers and, and non-commissioned commissioned officers left in the U Russian armed forces to do this kind of job, organization and logistics for such a huge army. So it would take, you know, they would, they would get millions of people into the army and this would, you know, stand around the, uh, the barracks and we don't know what to do because there are too few commanders to, to command them, actually. Just to command them, not to talk about training them. And then you have, you know, all of this is, is, is rolling further. Who is going to issue them with weapons? Who is going to train them on weapons? Who is going to form coherent units from them? You know, from, from platoon up to company level, to battalion level, to brigade level, to divisionary level. There is not enough of, of, of officers. There is not enough uh, of, of non-commissioned officers left in the Russian armed forces to do the job. So what they are doing is to recruit from uh, different associations, veteran associations, this is, these are people who are already who are already trained and they, they have the history of service in armed forces. And they are already, you know, it's easier to, to refresh their training in two or three weeks and send them to the front line. This is what they are doing. Most of such people are ending serving in, in private military companies, which is one of the things which that is that is I would say quite ignored in the West. Just how many battalion tactical groups, for example, Redut private military company or Wagner, which is much better known, have on the front lines meanwhile. How dependent on their operations is Putin meanwhile? This is something nobody is talking about. Everybody is talking about Russian armed forces. But whenever you check all the major advances of Russia of the last four or five months, it's always a private military company uh, that was that led the advance, you know, that, that led the penetration of the Ukrainian front lines. So, but Tom, you know, it's, surely it's working a different way. It's work. There is a mobilization already, but it's I, I want to come back to, to the PMC. Way. Yeah, Sorry, I want to come back to the PMC. But go ahead, Francis. No, but Tom, see, maybe I take a romanticized a approach to this, and and I think to myself, you know, nobody is going to fight harder for their country than a Ukrainian soldier or a Russian soldier. What of you're course. saying is these people are effectively mercenaries. Yeah. But doesn't that mean that they're going to have less allegiance to the cause that they're fighting for because they're they're there to get paid essentially? Uh, what should what should an average Russian fight for in Ukraine? It's as simple as that. He, I mean, okay, Putin is promising. You know, you can take loot with you, and if you get killed, you, your family is going to get a new ladder. Oh, great! Would you like to go <laughs> fighting somewhere for a new ladder? I wouldn't. As simple as that. So. You know what? What Putin is getting is some, so to say, outcasts in his armed forces, uh, or, or, or uh, weapons freaks, you know, and such people. They are already serving in armed forces. When they got get shot away, what he has to find some kind of replacements. So the the easiest way of finding a replacement is not a mass mo or general mobilization, but recruiting veterans, and this is what he is doing. And you, this is how he come already so far that even veterans of the war of the Soviet war in Afghanistan in 1980s are serving on the front lines. I mean, these are people in wow. their 60s. Yeah. So this is how it works in Russia because normal way doesn't work. No, what is normal to you or to me here in Europe, in the UK or in the United States is not normal in Russia. In Russia has its own normality, and this is entirely different than, than in our case. You shouldn't forget that 50% of Russians do not even have a water closet inside their home. They have to go outside into the, into some kind of cabin. Okay. So what shall they what shall they fight for in 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 Ukraine? It's either for loot or for lada in the case they can get killed or something else. But they they are not. Or for other, money. 
or for money in a private military company, as you say. So this is what I was going to ask you about, because I agree with you. I've been following, and it seems to me that all the breakthroughs, certainly in the Donbass, are being made by these private military companies. So why is their combat effectiveness higher? Because I see videos of Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, recruiting people from prisons now. How are they, that's what they're doing. How are they having such success relative to the rest of the Russian armed forces? Well, relative success, because they are drafting, they are recruiting veterans, people who have combat experience, who have served. Uh, you, for, take, for, whether you take Wagner or, or, or Red Hood, these are the leading private military comp companies in Russia, especially, but let's ignore Va Wagner, which is well known for a while, and let's take Red Hood. Red Hood is based right next to uh, major airborne units in, in uh, Peskov area. So this means they are neighbor. As soon as you, the day after you have quit your service in, in the airborne forces, you exit your barracks and vis-a-vis -vis there, there is a base of, of Red Hood uh, PMC. So what shall you do? Russia, Russia is huge. Perhaps you have already some other job. Perhaps you, you are going to find a job in some kind of private security company inside Russia or not. But let's say in, in a significant percentage of cases, you're not going to, kind of, to find any kind of uh, job, or at least nothing better paid, but what Red Hood is offering. So you go to a private military company. And by serving in such a company at earlier times, you had an outlook of, of you know, seeing something of the world, serving in Syria, in Libya, <laughs> in Central African Republic. Republic excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling about this or laughing about this because... You know, for average Russian, it is a lot. They do not manage to travel around. They do not have the money for that. It's true. Yeah. So what do you have uh, now? It, you have incentives. Okay, let's go serving in Red Hood. And Red Hood is full of former airborne troops, veteran airborne troops. And they are sent, they were, they were sent to Kiev together with, with uh, airborne troops and Spetsnaz at the start of the war. Nobody's talking about this. I don't know why. But they were there. They lost an enter battalion tactical group in Kiev or on approaches to Kiev. Nobody's talking about that. Not even Ukrainians. I don't know why. So it's it's a strange situation, actually. We, I think we, we are not paying enough attention at this aspect of uh, Russian war effort, so to say. But if you if you check the associations of such uh, of veteran associations of paratroopers, airborne troops, of Cossacks, of this and that, this this is over a million of people. So this is enough you know, huge enough pool for Putin to recruit from them. And Tom, why isn't it, if you say that winter is going to favour Ukraine more, why isn't Putin just going to go all in and just go, right, we need to make the gains now. Let's go all in, let's demoralise them, let's defeat them, and let's get this over with as soon as possible. He's, he's doing this all the time. He's doing this all the time. The problem is just that Due to put system Putin, it's not working. He was, you know, he was promising this Kinjal hypersonic missile, which is going to destroy any kind of enemy which against which there are no defenses. Half the NATO is crying about we don't have these defenses against this weapon. Yeah? And what happens? Eventually, Kinjal is uh, impossible to, to make operational without uh, Western uh, uh, information technologies. So what happens then? He fires one in, what was it, April or something, or March. He fires another one about a few weeks later, and then now he, uh, he has ordered a third deployment, and the missile just crashed inside Russia. It's not working. And why is it not working? Again, because of system Putin. Which, imagine running a high-technology enterprise under Putin's rule. You can't do that, because you, you need a huge investment of money. But Putin is not investing in, in, into the Russian economy. He's bunkering his money in, somewhere in the West or in China or wherever. So you are now a CEO of, let's say, a small enterprise. You launch something in, in a garage and you want to develop IT, ITs and uh, you, you want to, to make hardware. You, know, you, you need hard, hardware for such an enterprise. Where do you get this hardware? Russia is not manufacturing it. You have to import everything from the West. And this is already the crucial, crucial moment. You, you constantly need an intake of 
Western high technology in order to develop Russian high technology. And you have a mass massive problem with this. This costs a lot of money, which you don't have because you all the time have to pay Putin his share. As soon as you are successful as an entrepreneur in Russia, you have to put uh, to, to pay Putin his cut. Otherwise, you lose your enterprise and, and he appoints one of his favorites. And this is what's happening all the time under Putin's rule, actually, even, for, uh, even earlier. So it's not working. The system is not working. It's collapsing all the time. It takes ages to collapse completely, but it's collapsing. It's in, in, in the best way. And I suppose the question leading on from that, Tom, is how long are the, is Putin and the Russian forces, how long are they going to have the stomach for this fight? Because this can't carry on forever, surely. I don't know. I'm not into predicting future. I don't have any kind of a crystal ball to say. But, yeah. you know, sooner or later, it's going, there is going to be a big collapse. Right now, the situation, the situation is still so that, uh, that Russia is a fatalist or... or Yes, how, how else to describe them enough to follow their orders? The mass of Russian of, uh, troops are, you know, they are like that. Okay, you know, I don't have my own opinion. My superior commander told me this. Let's go do that. You know, what what he says. Let's follow his orders. That's the, the way they think. And when you when you check some of the interviews of uh, Russian prisoners of war taken by Ukrainian journalists, there is one who is specialized in such interviews. And you even hear from Russian uh, soldiers, they say. I'm surprised how much are your troops, Ukrainian troops, free to decide for themselves what, what are they going to do. We don't have this. We don't, we don't even think that way in Russia. You, you, you receive your order and you follow your order, period. That's it. That's what you do. In Ukraine, you discuss your order with your superior officer. You, you don't like something, you post a video on Facebook and say, we have unit so and so, we are refusing to fight because our officer is uh, corrupt or incompetent or sending us into 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 combat without necessary support this is ukrainian concept and it's work it works in russia you don't have you don't have such a concept at all and tom you were talking about the military technology side of things yes. which brings us onto an issue we haven't discussed yet which is of course sanctions uh and uh i think the lay people in the west think of sanctions as one thing so yeah military technology and oil and gas, and it all kind of just blends into one mm -hmm. thing. And there's a lot of people saying sanctions have been counterproductive because Russia's oil revenues are going up. Talk to us about sanctions. Are they working? Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? You know, what is the future of all of that? And what is the impact on Russia today? Uh, for the start, matter of fact is that Putin's entire military build-up, it's a big show actually, but let's call it a military build-up, uh, was financed by the West. So there's a difference, you know, to the last 20 years and now. From this point of view, it's even more important considering that the mass of Western customers for Russian oil and gas have signed long-term contracts, which stipulate that either you buy it or you don't buy it, but you have to pay. So you, you have to pay no matter how much have you have you have you imported from Russia? So in that in that regards, you know, even if let's say let's say let's take Austria as example. Austria now would would say, okay, I'm I'm cancelling my contract signed last year by our Holy Chancellor, uh, <laughs> um, who is now working for Google, by the way, uh, and and uh, let's now stop importing Russian gas. Austria would still have to pay several billions a year even if not importing a single ounce of, of Russian gas. And that until 2040, which is, which is, what, 18 years from now. So, ideal situation for Putin. Wait, would Austria honor that contract in the current situation? Would Austria, sorry? Honor the contract, would they pay? Well, Austria would have to pay, yes. It, it would have to honor it, yes. What else? You guys take your rules too seriously. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is the way the world is made. There is no reason, there is no superior reason that God didn't show himself up and, and said, oh, you Austrians are not going to, to import Russian oil anymore. What else should happen? A huge, a, a massive supernatural or, or natural cat catastrophe destroying the whatever. But Russia, but Austria has to, to, to continue importing and foremost, it has to continue paying. Germany is the same case. France, it, Italy, in front of France, the same case. This is why Putin hasn't con uh, canceled these contracts yet. 
he could cancel them, like he has canceled in the case of, of the Netherlands. In this case, he didn't cancel the contracts because he's profiting anyway from this. And uh, okay, of course, our government could now say, well, huh, okay, we are going to, to cancel this contract, but then we have to pay penalties. Even more so because the contract stipulates that we have to pay, continue paying, whether we buy, whether we import or not. So, you know, it's... Okay, so those sanctions, I'm assuming, are not going to have the effect the West wants. No. What about military technology transfer this and all, is all of that? very much. It is, for example, the, the, the freezing of, of uh, federal Russian reserves hurt Putin massively. It took away sometimes 25% of his money. Uh, then uh, high technology, freezing high technology. This is by far not exploited enough, this 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 field. One could really penalize Russia much more in this regards. They are still managing to buy, if nothing else, from Japan and from China. You know, Okay, China is even more reluctant to, to sell high technology to Russia these days than Japan is or South Korea is. So there, there is still a lot of opportunity in this regards. One could still hit Russians much harder in this regards. But... It shouldn't mean that sanctions are not hurting Russia. They are hurting it badly. And we are going to see how much just during this winter. And it starts hurting the Russian population as well. Uh, What's that going to look like, Tom? When you say that it's hurting, uh, what, what, is that, what are we going to see in Russia? Well, in worst case, uh, what is seems sometimes around 1917 that Russians do not like to be hungry and freezing in winter. It could happen the same. It, it could, could, you know would be the same, exactly the same, like in 1917, where it was uh, women working in ammunition factories, which rose as first, and then the October Revolution began. We are going Tom, to see. That... Perhaps it's going to happen, perhaps not. I don't know, but it could happen. Let's say this way. So, are you optimistic about the future, Tom? Has this Gen got better? <laughs> Generally, <laughs> I am. Generally, I am, because... Uh, generally, I see humanity as a positive, uh, a positive. How should I say this? Uh, positively developing uh, appearance in the nature. Uh, I mean, we, we we are doing lots of idiotic things and, and killing our, each other and killing the nature and so on. But sooner or later, at least five before twelve, you usually get sane. You know, after hitting the wall with with our forehead some five hundred to to one thousand times usually get sane and reasonable and, and start doing things the right way. So I think it's going to be this way in this case as well. I'm, 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 as I said, I'm generally, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. Well, on that happy note, at least, uh, Tom, we will wrap it up there. We're going to ask you a couple of questions for our supporters that they've already submitted for our locals. But before we let you go, and by the way, thank you so much for this. I'm sure we would love to have you back when there's more developments in, in, in this conflict in the future. Um, but uh, the question we always ask our guests before we let them go is, what is the one thing that we're not talking about as a society that you think we really should be? Except for this war. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I mean this seriously. I, I think we should generally be discussing uh, Putin's uh, involvement in subverting the entire Western democracies. This is uh, that there are several books, at least one of which I could recommend right away, uh, discussing this, but it's still not enough. But he has seriously subverted our societies, I mean, from inside out. And uh, we are feeling this every single day. And it's not just in the UK, not just in France, not in, just in Austria or Germany. It's really everywhere. It, it, he's, he has the presence behind the curtain, so to say, and he's still pulling strings around. This is one of the things. And the other thing well, is... Tom, what does that look like? What, what are you talking about? Putin has a massive, uh, they call this black cash, massive amounts of, of, of mm -hmm. money. On, on accounts owned by his uh, favorites in the West. And he's, uh, with help of this cash, he's influencing even the justice systems of, of entire countries, UK between, in between of this. Not only U USA, but UK and, and, and France and Austria and so on. So this, these are immense um, volumes of money which he's using to subvert our societies. And this is what I think should be intensively discussed and sorted out. You know, nothing happened so far to anybody in this regards. No, nobody was, you know, 
made responsible for, for, for letting himself or herself being bribed by all this money. It is actually dis- destructive for our societies. I agree with you. Uh, Tom Cooper, thank you so much. Where can people uh, read your uh, updates? Uh, tell everybody where to find your work online. Well, it's uh, the easiest is on medium.com. If you check uh, uh, Ukraine War and, and Tom Cooper, you can easily find the link. I mean, if I check the link, just a second, precisely. Medium.com uh, slash at Tom Cooper. Tom, it's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure. We're going to uh, get, have some questions from our local supporters just afterwards. But thank you so much for coming on the show. You've been a wonderful guest and very illuminating. Mm, very much my pleasure. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to the show. And if you've enjoyed our episodes, they always go out on Wednesdays and Sundays, 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard. Our raw shows go out Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. Uh, Barton Cessna says, how significant are China uh, to Russia and Russia to China? military relations and could they become more significant uh, given attrition in the Russian military at the moment?